Then I go to Katoa, ko Javid Ali Toko Inua, ke Sport Waitaki Aho e Mahiana. Welcome to the first of our diversity and inclusion series of On the Count, starting with the experiences of the South Asians in sport. Before we begin, um, I'm, well, sorry, before we begin, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am. So I'm Javid, um, the Community Sport and Recreation Team Lead for Sport Waitaki. And this evening, we will, we will be discussing the experience of my South Asian panelists um, in organized sport. So hopefully these conversations will provoke some thought in how your club can engage and support the South Asian community in and around your club. Before we get into it, I'd like to open up, with, open up the session with a karakia. A karakia is an affirmation and connection between individuals to support and put us in a safe space to come together and share our stories uniting in a common purpose. Tutawa mai runga, tutawa mai raro, tutawa mai roto, tutawa mai waho. Kia tau a te Māori tū, kia tau a te Māori ora, kia tātou katoa. Tuturu whakamaua, kia tina, haume huie tai kie. And in translation, um, it says, I gather from above, I gather from below, I gather from within and the surrounding environment. The universal, um, universal vitality and energy to infuse and enrich all present unified, connected, and blessed. So we're getting into, into our session here. So thank you for joining us. Um, West Auckland is one of the most diverse regions in Auckland. And it's predicted by 2038 that 50% of the West Auckland community will either identify as Asian, Pacifica, or even both. Currently South Asians, which is those who identify from the, um, from the subcontinent, either India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal, account for about 13% of the West Auckland population. This is a 43% increase from 2013. With, within the South Asian community, there are a number of different cultures, religions, languages, and dietary requirements. And hopefully we'll be unpacking some of these today. But the majority of us, our um, South Asian community reside, reside in the Faux local board area. More than one in five Faux residents identify as being South Asian. How does your organization stack against these numbers? And do you capture your ethnic data? Something for you to ponder while we have a chat. So joining me today is on the far, on my far left is Hussain Hanif, who is a, the former diversity and inclusion participation specialist at Cricket Victoria and current director of cricket at Parnell Cricket Club. And next to him is our very own Healthy Families Waitaki team member, Nishal Chakravati, who is a self-proclaimed cricket weekend warrior. And he'll tell us a little bit about that soon. So before we begin, do both of you want to just tell us a little bit about yourselves? Do you want to start, Nish? Sure. Um, so my name is Nish Chakravarti. You can call me Nish. Um, most people do. I'm from Bangalore in, uh, in India, so moved here when I was nine. Um, I didn't start playing organized sport until relatively late in my life and had, I've had a, um, a range of experiences with organized sport in school and in club as well. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's about it. Cool. Yeah, me. Thank you, Nish. Um, my name is Hussain Hanif, or Huss, uh, born in Auckland. Uh, parents are from, or I guess background is Fijian Indian, but Muslim, um, and played organised sports from a young age, five or six, um, starting at Eden Ross School, playing in the western suburbs, out in suburbs, um, New Lynn, um, represented Auckland in age group cricket, and then uh, led to Australia, playing and coaching in Australia. Cool. That's awesome. So I guess... For our um, team watching live, before we get into the juicy stuff and joining us live, um, just make sure for the flow of our conversation that we're on mute um, and you know, our cameras are off. Um, if you do have any questions out or you know, things that you want us to come um, have a conversation about, use the chat function on either Zoom and Facebook Live and um, we hope to answer the questions. And if we don't get through them all this evening, we may be able to address them in the coming days or a follow up coffee chat with the panelists see how it all goes so um while we're here so Nish you, you mentioned that you start you didn't start playing you know organized sport until you're quite late um talk us through how that happened yeah so um we moved here when I was nine and mum and dad have had a heavy focus on on work um they didn't quite they wanted us to play sport um, my brother and I um but they didn't really know you know where to go to access for, for us to access sport um and really, I guess the focus was more on academia, yeah. um, as is for a lot of Asian parents <laughs> and Asian families in general. Um, 
so I didn't really start playing sport to organize sport till I was uh, in, in high school. So one of the big reasons I got into, into um, cricket was uh, I went to watch a couple of mates who were playing um, fourth form, uh, cricket in fourth form for high school. And um, the batsman hit the ball and started jogging halfway down, down the wicket, realized I was going to the fielder. This is from the school I was in, a moral school. And um, he just sort of stood around and, and meandered his way back to the crease. And in that time, the fielder had picked up the ball and, and, and thrown out the stumps and he hit the, he hit the stumps. Yeah. And the guy just couldn't be bothered turning around and going back to the, his crease. Jeez. So I thought, I can do a better job than this guy. Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, that was um, what sparked me going, oh, I'll play organized cricket for high school. And then that led to yeah, playing um, at Eden Ross School as well and at under 17. So that's where the first time I played organized cricket in, in the club. Cool. So obviously sport was something that was big at your house. You guys played it, you and your brother. Yep. So it was something that was normalized. It's not something yeah. new. So for us, uh, the whole concept of organized sport was quite, uh, it was, I guess, a bit new. Um, so in India, I was there till I was nine. So we played sport on the street. So um, the first sport I really have played was badminton. And it was mum and mum would um, take us out onto the street and we used to play there. And, you know, just generally in the sport in India was us and a bunch of kids um, from the street playing on the street. So it wasn't necessarily, you had to go to a, um, a, a field with the, with the proper um, wicket um, and, and have the right gear or anything like that. It was just sport and that's what we used to do. And even moving to um, New Zealand, we used to play sport in high school, right? And at lunchtime you, you put some bags down and, and you, you get a couple of balls out and you play rugby or football or whatever. Yeah. It was never really, it was more play than it was um, sport. So. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting because I guess you know you come to New Zealand. There's heaps. You know, all of a sudden you can't really play on the streets, or you know, it's not as accessible as what it might be back home. Yeah. Um, Huss, you said that you started playing cricket. You're, you've got a different story. You started playing organised sport a lot younger. Do you want to talk us through how that happened? Yeah. So it was probably around 1992 World Cup. My grandmother lived across the road from Eden Park. World Cup was on. New Zealand, Pakistan. Um, she used to park cars in the back of the, the house, but when the cars moved, we used to get the cricket kit out to sort of play as well. So it was really good um, to sort of, from a grassroots perspective, playing in backyards. It was sort of the Kiwi thing to do as well. So integrate with um, different uh, members of the wider community as well on the street, as you mentioned, or in the parks and so forth. And that led to uh, playing for a club, Eden Rosco as well. As well. Um, a, a diverse sort of cricket club, um, which attracted a lot of South Asians in Mount Roskill. Um, and that allowed me to then progress sort of thing. So um, yeah, from backyard to, to club cricket, really. Yeah. That's cool. I think, yeah, I, I share a, I share a similar story in terms of, you know, there were, I had friends that were playing club cricket at school and then they're kind of like, oh, you know, school, um, you know, school cricket kind of happened, but you had like 20 kids in one team and, all of a sudden, you know, the club system was there and that's how we got there. So talking about the club system, it's kind of common knowledge in New Zealand that we, if you, your child wants to play sport, you're going to go and sign them up to a club. Obviously, Nish, you, you know, you spoke about, you know, back home, that's not necessarily the case. What was your guys' experiences going and joining up to a club the first time? Um, you know, what, what were the things that were positive or negative or whatever that may be? Yeah, so, I mean, growing up, uh, I had a single mother who was um, pretty much, you know, um, taking me to games and so forth. There was one thing I did notice, though, um, a lot of the South Asian community wouldn't volunteer. And I had a mum who was a single mum, working two jobs, three kids. So it was quite hard in that sense to volunteer the time. But whenever there was a game on, picnic rug is out, you know, put the pitch to the tent up, um, sitting with junior, other junior parents as well. One thing I've sort of noticed now is there's a lack of volunteering in the South Asian communities. But it also comes back to why are they not volunteering as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, research done in Australia on why, and and we you know we go back to there's not a lot of volunteering in in India, for example, Sri Lanka, or Bangladesh. It's a paid sport where you pay the money and you sort of play the game, and someone delivers all the volunteering hours. Where here community clubs require volunteers to run. Um, so it's a, a bit of a difference, I guess. Um, yeah. Oh, it's interesting you say that because one of my earliest experiences when I played for um, under 17s my first year we had our prize giving and to this day I remember one of the speeches that was given at that time um, by someone who worked at the club and they basically indicated that you know um, 
cricket clubs are often a dumping ground for, for kids for, for the South, Indian, South Asian community, um, which was really interesting to hear because mum's very similar. So my mum never really volunteered, but when the games are on, you know, um, there's a, a couple of families um, where the parents would come along to a lot of the games and you could hear them in the sideline yelling and, and whatever, and you're going, oh my God, stop it. <laughs> um, you know, but it was, it's quite interesting that you, that you say that, eh? It's very, you know, from my experience, that is very true. That um, often the volunteering is lacking. Yep. Yeah. But also the why question. I guess, is, uh... Yeah, the other areas, obviously, as well. Um, and a lot of South Asians playing the game, food, you know, basic. Um, kai is probably one thing that brings a lot of people together where they still have the sausage sizzle. So, you you know, you're sort of standing in the corner waiting for the vegetarian sausage <laughs> or the vegetarian patty. Um, where it's just a little bit of education required to sort of make that change to try and create an inclusive uh, environment as well for everyone, yeah. where it's just education. Um, there was a, probably a lack of education where how do we now get sporting clubs to, you know, um, really uh, buy into what is the culture and how do we actually um, get to engage with the wider community as well. Yeah, that's cool. I guess, Hus, you know, you and I are both Muslims and obviously, the Muslim community, you know, has halal meat requirements in terms of it, and I guess with those sausage sizzles, you kind of you kind of feel left out sometimes as a kid, right? And you really don't want to. If we want to create these inclusive environments, it's really important that we do that. And obviously, our Hindu communities have their own kind of dietary requirements, and some of them don't eat beef. Some of them are purely vegetarian. I think it's really just having a good conversation with them, right, and just understanding the people. Yep. Um, so I guess kind of back to the we've gone we've gone full circle and I'm going to come back to the question but I guess if you guys can remember the time you registered or a time that you went in and you're like okay I'm going to play the sport what's um you know what was your experience then were were the club open or do you feel like they were welcoming or how, how did you guys find that experience um it was challenging and intimidating yeah. um so I remember walking in to a club uh, when I first, when one of the first years that I registered and I had the form, um, had mum with me and we didn't really know where to go. You walk up and there's the, the club rooms and there's a bar and there's not really anyone around and you kind of feel like you're an intruder in this space. Mm -hmm. um, so it was quite, it was quite intimidating. I just wanted yeah. to get it over and done with and go and play. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. similar. It was, yeah. um, it was actually, it was quite funny. It was very similar, but there was a lot of South Asians just standing at a door. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and then you had, uh, e, uh, I think his name was uh, Adrian Einstein, who's a yeah. club manager, sort of trying to welcome people in and usher them in. Yeah. Um, so essentially, and that was the first experience of the cricket club, right? And yeah. so you feel awkward. Then you feel, you know, when you meet your actual teammates, you just become uh, mates and you play cricket. And yeah. that cricket is probably the connector. Yeah. So people don't see you because of your skin color, your age, your ethnicity or whatever. Mm -hmm. They see you as a cricketer and that sort of creates that community mm -hmm. um, from that first experience onwards, you know. Yeah, I think there was, um, there's a kind of a great story in terms of Glenfield Rugby Club um, with the activation program with our hub, with our team at Harbour Sport. They, they ran a pilot where they had a welcome person who was of China, from the Chinese community and welcomed people into the clubs. Do you guys think if you guys had that, experience it would be something different yeah 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 i think in australia we did that once again the research and that was one of the big things welcoming officers create um amazing opportunities for people who normally wouldn't play the game yeah how did they then create opportunities to find that mum who's very shy and try and open up and try and engage and keep that mum in the game for from year one to you know all the way through juniors um whether it's a scorer that's never scored, it's that welcoming officer can actually educate to say, this is what you need to do on the iPad or this is how you actually score. Um, umpiring was one big area, for example. So uh, I think those little little things like welcoming yeah. officers uh, make a huge experience, um, first experience, you know, as well. And even as, I mean, I would have been in my mid-teens when, when I had that experience. I can only imagine what it would have been like if you're eight nine years old walking into that environment and going you know i don't belong here yeah so it i think in my personal opinion i think it would make quite a big difference to, when you walk in to have a familiar face in a way yeah um someone who, who you can relate to yeah so people generally gravitate to people that look or sound the same as, yeah. as each mm -hmm. other right so if we're going to try and get our south asian community that could be like a nice quick easy way quick easy win you know someone that's been part of your prem team someone that's you know could be just a long-term Club member, right? That 
that's just a familiar face for people to connect with. So that that's really cool in terms of your entry. So now you guys are into the club. Talk to me about what your experiences were. So obviously, us, you've had a few different experiences. Nish, you've um, you played multiple sports and you kind of, you know, you've gone down a different pathway. You know, so I, either of you want to talk to, yeah, what your experience as a player was? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of look at Australia. Um, playing Premier Cricket in Queensland, for example, is very different um, to playing junior cricket here, for example. Um, it's all about winning culture. Um, so being a young South Asian in the middle of, you know, no, nowhere in, uh, in Queensland for the first time sort of playing cricket was an unusual experience because first being South Asian, there wasn't many South Asians around. <laughs> yeah. um, and so essentially they, they dig you as the good fast bowler or the best batter or whatnot. Um, starting in the falls, for example, was an experience in itself. It was just their culture was different. So um, what could I bring? Once again, um, a good cricketer. So I've become Hus or Hussein the cricketer, not the same that Asian guy, right? Who plays in our team sort of thing. So, um, and then two or three games in, you just become one of the, yeah. you know, cricketers per, per se. So um, it's sort of, yeah, you have to break out of your shell and, and so forth. And and then sharing the experiences of being Muslim. Okay, educating people to say, hey, when we're having a barbie, I'll bring my own sort of meat or yeah. am I able to bring veggie patties and, you know, throw it on the barbie as well, for example. Mm -hmm. So just little things, but yeah, it was a, opening yeah. open eye sort of experience as well cool. Nish, yourself? i had quite a different experience yeah. uh, so because because i started quite late um it was really mates that i already knew and would spend lots of time with that i ended up playing with um and so my experience with the cricket from a, as a player was quite different in that uh you know the, the registration the club side of things was still like oh my gosh but actually the playing side was a lot easier because I knew most of the boys um, and we were friends outside outside of cricket. Um, so it was just another thing that I got to experience with my mates. Yeah. Um, and that continued for, all, you know, as, basically as long as I've, I've played and, and uh, played cricket really. Yeah. So I guess we've, we've got kind of two different kind of angles here. We've got the social, you know, we've called um, Nish the weekend warrior, <laughs> you know, because he's, you know, played down that social route and he's gone with his mates and continued to play for, for a number of years. And then Huss, obviously, he's gone through what one may say is a performance pathway in terms of up to premier cricket and um, and that kind of stuff. So I guess, Huss, what I want to really unpack is, um, you know, did you feel like at any point in time that you couldn't bring your whole self? Was there parts of you that you had to hide as a player? Yeah, it was interesting. It was, it was only when I got to Australia where um, it, there wasn't many role models. So we had Fawad Dharman, the first um, a refugee that had uh, played for Australia, a Pakistan born refugee who had played for Australia. There was no spinners at the time, but he was a real role model. But that was two or three years uh, in. So seeing someone like that created a lot of opportunities for kids to go, well, I want to be the next Fawad. Um, Usman Khawaja was another one that was coming through, Lisa Stalaker, for example. So it created opportunities for boys and girls to sort of come through. Um, but there were certain times, I mean, I'd get the prayer mat out, for example, and people would be like, what are you up to, you know, <laughs> at, at, at tea break? Um, and it questioned people, but also um, after, after a while, it educated people. So um, it's doing little things in community cricket clubs that will change their perspective of who the person is and what the cultures are and religions are, for example. Um, so that was probably the major one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the whole, if you can see it, you can be it is probably a big one. And Australia sort of did that really well with Fawad Ahmed, Usman Khawaja, Lisa, um, Alana King, for example, young South Asian spinner playing for Melbourne, uh, Victoria and, and the Melbourne Stars, um, sort of using that to then educate others. Yeah. Um, so using sports in that sense, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I guess, w what we see well in Australia is, especially in that cricket circle, is now we're seeing more South Asians coming up and playing in, in the Big Bash and, you know, Sheffield Shield cricket and stuff like that. I guess in terms of that kind of stuff, do you guys have maybe a tip or something that, you know, clubs could use to, to understand people a bit more? Or, you know, if you're unsure, because sometimes we're unsure, when you know, when, you, when someone new is there, you're unsure, you're just like, oh, I don't know. Am I going to offend them or am I going to, you know, so, you know, either of you from your experiences, what, what would be sort of a, a question to, to understand and, and break the ice maybe? Um, 
I think if there was, I mean, this is maybe a little bit quick thinking, but yeah. <laughs> uh, if there was more um, work done around um, cultural sensitivity mm -hmm. and w within clubs, um, I think that could go, and it speaks to a lot, a lot of what you said already, Huss. Um, you know, it doesn't take a lot to make someone feel included, but also, and having said that, you don't have to do anything to make someone feel excluded, yeah. <laughs> and it's a lot easier to do nothing. Um, and, and in that space, and um, you know, I played cricket for as long as I did. If I'd had that original initial experience and I didn't have friends who kept me playing, I'm not sure whether I would have continued. And yeah, so that very first experience of I walked into a club and there's it just feels like an intimidating space and, and there's nothing there for a, for a new young player who you know um, isn't white um, or may not understand how things work in a club setting or an organized sports setting to actually just have someone there and go oh hey how you going um, it doesn't even have to be brown face as long as you know it's just someone that's relatable or someone that that um, you can go cool you actually understand yeah, I think um, there's not a lot of resources in New Zealand for cultural education in that sense. So, you know, um, how do we then create that? I think Australian cricket's got a sport for all resource, which um, provides sporting clubs um, opportunities to um, actually go out and talk to their members and understand who their members are. I think, Javid, um, we spoke about it. So with Australian cricket or Victorian cricket, we looked at um, local um supermarkets would go on a Sunday when it's the busiest period, would go on a Friday evening when we know that um, families are going in. You stand in the middle and you look around and you do a you know, quick quick um, sort of check on who the people are and, and these are the actual people living in that particular area because mm. they're buying from their local, for example. And does that cricket club or sports club reflect um, that particular community that you've seen at the supermarket mm -hmm. and seldomly it wouldn't right so you're saying well how can we open the door to create that inclusive environment for them to do that um, then you ask the question why don't you play cricket and uh, a lot of South Asians um, weren't involved in club cricket they'll be involved in playing tape ball cricket and they'll be involved in playing backyard cricket and whatnot but they weren't in a club um, sort of um, scene so you know, breaking the ice and bringing them into the community, but also the other way, educating the club to say, this is what is required to try and keep them in the game for longer as well. Yeah, I know we've um, we've had a heavy focus on cricket, but I guess that's kind of, the three of us have had a strong experience in cricket, but yeah, you, know, you kind of look at it in the same way as badminton. And I was, um, you know, a while back, I remember going into the Linfield Rec Centre and on a Saturday morning, we at Sport Waitaki had a programme with Sport Auckland that we're running for our Indian community. And we, um, I was just kind of walking around and so many of them were playing badminton and it's just, they just turn up and play badminton. And it's like, how do we bring that, those two communities together, right? And I guess um, the first start is having a conversation, right? And it's like, how do you, it's, it's always difficult. It's always hard, but you find the right person and all of a sudden it's a whole, a whole new story, right? And I guess, you know, you did some work with the Nepalese groups in, in Australia, or maybe do you want to touch on that? Yeah, so we had a, um, a lot of non-organised competitions that were running um, and what Australian cricket wanted to do is obviously bring them into the data so we can see those numbers reflected in the Australian uh, census through cricket as well, uh, but also to try and engage them in the local community club. So um, yeah, there was multiple, but also from a pathway point of view, most, multiple leagues we're working with, community leagues, um, but what we found was also there was barriers to participation for them to play at the club. Um, so cost was one where you can play Sunday cricket and it'll cost you less money. Um, turn up, you don't, you're not stuck to a club. If you've got a shift or you've got a job, for example, on, then you don't have to turn up on that day. Someone else will fill your spot. Um, and one of the big ones was prize money. So they had big prize money um, that were up for grabs, for example. Um, and then we went to clubs and said, how can we educate yourself to look at um, ways of subs can be paid, for example, just little things um, to tweak. Um, and, and then also what can we bring from these community competitions back to the club? Yeah. Can we run them at the club? So then half the members become the club members the following year. They, they familiarize themselves with the actual uh, community that's around them. Um, and also understand how can we use our community facility outside of the normal cricket cricket hours, for example, as well. So 
Um, that then led to, at the time, the Big Bash was on and WBBL. Uh, we didn't see a lot of South Asians um, playing in the Australian system. How can we find those hidden gems, for example? Um, so diamonds in the rough, they were out there. There was very fast bowlers. There was a lot of big hitters uh, in cricket. And then how can we actually find those diamonds and actually get them into club system so we can see that progression of more South Asians coming through. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are sort of two areas, key areas, pathways, and also club connections from playing community sport. Yeah. So it's almost like you can, you know, there you go out on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning and you drive around and there's so many pockets of our ethnic communities that are just going and playing sport, right? If you're a club member with a club shirt on, why not go and have a conversation, right? You can't, you know, the worst thing is that they'll say, no, we're okay. And, you know, if they say yes, you're, you're all in and, you you know, you might have a new new team. I think what I want to really touch on is you mentioned earlier, and we had this conversation before we started, was the pay-to-play model. So pay-to-play is becoming a big thing in terms of sport why not only in the south asian community but you know it seems to work quite well and you know do you guys want to just kind of talk about your experiences and what you've seen and potentially you know how you even got your story with university <laughs> yeah so uh what Joe was talking about so uh through university we played a lot of indoor cricket and um some of those were the most popular uh, you know one day sort of competitions that I ever saw um, where South, South in, or Southeast Asians, Indians um, participated in. And it was amazing. It was the whole day um, we had uh, Action Indoor um, on Dominion Road booked out. Um, and there must have been maybe 20 different teams um, that played. And it, it was just, it, it wasn't cheap. Indoor cricket isn't cheap. Um, but it attracts a lot of people, a lot of the Indian community to come along um, and, and play. It was some of the most fun experiences I've had. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that kind of talks to be, um, you know, like your modified formats all of a sudden, right? So it's not not about traditional, you know, if we look at cricket, you're playing on a Saturday from, you know, you know I played from 12.30 to 6.30 on Saturday, you know, not everyone wants to play like me and go out there and, you know, even if it's rugby, you're playing rugby on a Saturday, football on a Saturday, um, you know, all these other sports on different nights. And so I guess, um, you know, Hust, you, what do you think is the, the value of modified formats for engagement with our South Asian community? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to soccer or cricket. Soccer yeah. is 90 minutes. Um, community leagues here, well, 10, 10 years ago before I, I, I left and came back, um, soccer, community ethnic tournaments, for example, the Fijian Indian community or mm -hmm. um, Sikh community would, would only be 45 minutes games. So short and sharp, um, they get the tournament done in three days. Um, but then what we were having is, is sporting clubs coming in and actually scouting players. Um, and similar with cricket, cricket was, as you mentioned, start at nine o'clock, you pay <laughs> subs, you know, $300 plus, um, and you finish at 6, 6 p.m. on a Saturday, that's your whole day gone. Whereas a traditional Sunday league would be three hours, an hour and a half if you bat, um, an hour and a half if you bowl, and some bowlers would bowl four overs and they're done for the day if you play a super super 12 rule. So what we also found was also working with what works for these communities. Um, and es essentially work was a big thing. The Nepalese community work was a, a major um, thing in the nursing industry in Melbourne, for example, uh, or in Hobart. We, we had to actually modify what day suits them. Um, and so essentially understanding what they want and then working with them and try and getting the club to then understand that we need to actually work together here and provide these facilities. A normal cricket club, if you think about it, or a sporting club, um, so cricket, um, summer, Tuesday, Thursday's main day, Saturday, they'll play the games. Whereas what happens on Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday? Sunday is traditionally a family day. So how can we then engage the wider community to come and use this facility? It becomes a community facility. So. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting point you make about um, clubs coming along to, to community events to scout. And I'm wondering if part of that is a trust, trust thing, right? You've got people who run these community events. They'll run a ton of other events for that community, not just sport related. And so when they go, cool, we're going to do a, a cricket competition or a badminton competition, you've got that whole community coming along and saying, yeah, we'll be part of it. We'll, we'll, we'll pay money or whatever it is to be part of this. And we'll come along, we'll bring the food, We'll bring our family, you know, and, and we'll come and share everything. Um, that's something that we've spoken about earlier is, you know, my name is Nishchal Chakravarti. It's not easy to pronounce. 
and it's harder to spell. Yeah. <laughs> but having said that, as a South Indian, there are lots of other names that are that are equally hard or harder to um, pronounce and, and spell. And the the awards that I got and and whatever else, and um, same as other people on my team, they would come out with the, the incorrect spelling. And it, you know, it's 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 a it's a laugh at the time, but when you reflect on it, it it's it shows how much that club values you as a as a player for them, as a part of their club, because they they've got your name written down on paper, and they it's almost like they couldn't be bothered translating that, yep. just as it's written onto um, onto your award or or, or whatever you're you're being given. So this yep. it, it comes back to the trust. I think yeah, definitely, and that's a big thing, and that's something it's a good lead in and kind of a conversation around names right and it's kind of like my name is spout javid and for years people have said it and for years i've kind of been okay with it and i've just kind of run with it because it is easier for me to say okay that's fine rather than being like no it's java no it's java no it's java and i guess you know you two kind of have shortened your name to to make it that way and kind of i guess hassan you know what was what was your point that you know you kind of like I'd just rather be called Husk because it's easier. Yeah, it's an Aussie thing. I think as soon as I got to Australia, the first job I got, um, sort of, what's your name, Hussein? And they sort of said, okay, Husk is your name now. <laughs> so they sort of abbreviate everything. Yeah. Jeremy becomes Jez or yeah. you know, Michael becomes Mike and so forth. So um, that's where it really, yeah. yeah, got the name Husk. I think, yeah, and I, I guess it's, you know, although sometimes, you know, they say it, it's, the question is, is you know, a lot of people, you know, ask would be like, oh, what's your name? How oh, can I call you by this? But what what we, um, you know, my personal experience is you just want people to make an effort, right? If you if people can make an effort to say your name correctly, it makes the world good. And, you know, I've been in your pos position, Nish, and, you know, um, you know, I was at a, at a sports club in an award, and I think, you know, I was coaching a team, and they gave me the best supporter of the year award, and my name was spelt with an R in it. And I was just like, <laughs> where is there an R in my name? But, you know, someone's planted it in there and it's there. And the trophy sits, you know, still sits on the mantelpiece. But, you know, it's just something like, well, you know, could you have tried a little bit harder? And, you know, you had my details somewhere and, and stuff like that. So I think that's, you know, some great, some great points. And I guess let's just keep working, keep those wheels turning and make sure that you just make an effort and work together with someone, right? I think there's another piece to that as well as the education piece. So if you've got a community cricket club, badminton club or you know, softball club, whatever it is, and you want to engage in a particular community, it's best to get your education in there. You know, um, spelling the names of little one percenters, but essentially there's other things, food items, for example, to try and keep that person to stay from year one all the way through. It's their first experience in a particular sport and you want to make it really inclusive and welcoming. So um, yeah, just doing those little one percenters by actually understanding who your community is around you um, would probably make a major difference uh, into trying to keep that person. Yeah. And building end. on that as well, so something that um, one of my colleagues said in a meeting a couple of days ago, or last week would have been, um, that really resonated with me is when, you've, when you're the one trying to make outreach to a community, the onus is on you to make the effort, yeah. not on them to come, come to you. So he, was, he said something very, very simple, you know, if I'm reaching out to community, I don't organize meetings in, in my office, I'll go and see them. You know, it's just, it's just a small thing, but it makes, it makes a world of difference, right? So, you know, it's just, it is that 1%. It's... Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. I was listening to a, a webinar a while back and it said, um, you know, they talked to a club leader or, a, or an organized sport leader and they said, what do you do to make your club inclusive? And they said, oh, well, we include everyone. And it's, you know, these conversations that we're just having here is, you know, you need to be explicitly inclusive. And if you're, if you're seen to be making a real good effort, then all of a sudden, you know, that, that makes you feel welcome. You know, all of a sudden, you know, my dad, who's, you know, he migrated from Fiji in the 80s. If he sees halal food in the canteen, he's going to go and buy me something. But if he's, you know, if he doesn't, he's like, oh. I don't know if they're going to mix anything or, you know, if it's going to be right or whatever. And so we'll just go home and eat. And then all of a sudden clubs are thinking, oh, well, these guys don't want to support the club, but there's a, there's a bigger story behind it. Right. Mm. So that's cool. I guess the next little bit that I wanted to talk about was volunteering and Hus, you touched on it um, a lot earlier, but we did some research a couple of years ago and um, clubs reported that on average, there were 0.4 members 
of South Asian descent on club boards or committees. So why do you, I mean, you know, we talk, I can talk about my experience, my parents, personal experiences, my parents are very similar to both of yours, you know, they will come and watch me play cricket. They, you know, at 30 years old, they will still come and watch me referee rugby, but you know, they, they don't have, you know, they don't, they've never really volunteered. So I guess with your experiences and your family experiences, what do you think is the barrier for them to, to volunteer? Yeah, I think like my personal experience and also in Australia learning and um, doing the research is actually trying to encourage more people to do it, yeah. but actually providing the research, on, uh, sorry, the um, evidence on what, what is required in that sense as well. So um, in Australia, we actually education sessions were very big in community clubs. So why do you need to volunteer? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time it was pathways, for example, pathways in cricket and, and, and sport in general mm -hmm. requires volunteer assistance, right? It's not always run by the association or, you know, the, the state or the district, for example. So um, you need those volunteers. Um, and a lot of the time the coaches are the dad, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you don't volunteer, then you don't get those opportunities. And, and it's kind of sad in a sense, but um, you kind of need to educate the parents that they do need to. So one of the biggest things we do, for example, in early learning programs is to um, create a square. And that square, for example, when kids turn up, is the parent standing there with a cone and the kid throwing a ball. So you're engaging the, the, the parent straight away to say, well, you are paying money. You're not going to drop your child and just go. Um, he or she is five to seven years old and this is their first experience we want you to do that so then when you go home you've got the cone in your hand or, or a bucket or a uh, anything and you're sort of you're playing playing the game in the backyard um, what that then leads to is the parent he or she um, getting educated by actually turning up being a part of the wider community all the parents go down and sit together while the coach takes over for example so the rest of the session that's the first engagement so if you can start at grassroots, brilliant opportunity to sort of engage all the parents. Because what we were finding is kids would turn up, drop off, dad would get a cricket set with his other mates and they'd go play <laughs> cricket on the side. And that tends to happen a lot here um, or even in Australia. And so, yeah, trying to create that, you know, that education is probably a, a big thing. I, th I think you touched on something really important as well is um, to, I started cricket, as I said, really, I started cricket really late. So for uh, my parents, I don't even think they realized there was a need to volunteer. And it's something you said earlier, right? And particularly in places like India, you pay your fee, everything's taken care of. Yeah. And so there's almost the education piece for to help parents understand, um, get, an, get a better understanding of how the club system works here. Yeah. But also on, on the flip side to say, these, it's, you know, it's not volunteering isn't you spending hours and hours and hours um, every single day or whatever or every saturday whatever it is it's actually just coming along and holding a cone for an hour yeah. while your kid trains or being participating in that training actually you you're going to get an active role in helping your kid um, develop or play with them or whatever it is like i said mum she's she would spend an hour and a half two hours almost daily with us on the street playing badminton yeah. so it's not necessarily that she um so she's very sporty and to, I think if she'd been told, actually, it's just this simple, there might have been scope for her to just come along and, and go, hey, I'm going to participate. And I don't know that because, you know, we didn't start at, at that age, but it's almost, there's twofold, right? It's the education piece of this is what a club requires, but also this is what volunteering means. Yeah. Um, this, is what, this is what volunteering actually is in terms of actions. Yeah, and I think the big thing there is our ethnic communities and our South Asian communities generally have all those skills, right? But they just don't have the confidence or the yeah. you know the willingness to come forward because you know I I remember I talking to my dad once and he said I was like oh why don't you do this he's like oh yeah but you know what if I do it wrong or you know but it's like he drives a truck you know 40 hours a week he drops it off he knows roads like the back of his hand but you know you go and ask him to do this in a different environment all of a sudden it's mm -hmm. it's different and I guess um, you know how how do we what do you guys think would would kind of break that barrier obviously education is one piece but how do you think we can kind of get parents to kind of be like okay well i'm going to be vulnerable or you know to be able to do something like that it's manaki tanga right it's it's actually building up their mana and saying this is how you this is what you are capable of 
And rather than saying, we'll teach you how to do this, it's, it's almost flipping it around saying, you're already capable yeah. of, of these things, you know, holding your cone while your kid throws it into it. Yeah. It's, it's almost simplifying it and breaking it down to show or help them understand it's, they've got the skills. It's not something that they don't know that they're having to learn um, new. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think you touched on it straight away there. And also understanding you need these volunteers, right? So mm -hmm. to actually get sport running and going again, uh, giving back. Um, yeah, so essentially, I think, I think yeah, that giving back, but also wider of a uh, part of, sorry, a wider community as well. The education comes back again, giving back, the yeah. volunteer recognition, those sorts of things. And I think that's a big piece. And we, we kind of talk about volunteering as a, in a whole, and, you know, not only just our South Asian community, it's, it's a, there's, so, there's many aspects of, you know, being welcoming to a volunteer and, you know, even as such as a thank you, or just to, you know, shake their hand or, you know, whatever it may be, and just be like, thank you for giving up your time. All of a sudden, someone feels appreciated and all of a sudden they want to come back again, right? And that's at the end of the day, who doesn't like being told, thank you, you've done a great job, right? So, I mean, I guess, you know, we, we've done some, we've chatted about some great things here. And I guess for me is, you know, if there was something that was, there's one experience that you guys have had, how, you know, and that's shaped the way that you've played sport or your, um, your children, or, you, you know, what experience do you not want your children to have? Um, is there, you know, is there something that that's come up that, you know, you'd like to see done differently? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, racism in sports probably a big area. Mm -hmm. um, in Australia, it's quite, you know, it is quite, cricket can be a hostile sort of sport. Um, so prior to working um, in for Victorian cricket is in the diversity inclusion role, um, I experienced firsthand racism itself. And I, and I kind of educated myself that you don't want your children to grow up in this environment. Mm -hmm. um, so I took on that lead role of actually educating others around to say, we don't want that. Um, that led to Victorian cricket and Australian cricket by educating people on what you shouldn't do um, when playing cricket. And, and I think, you know, leaving that mark is um, essentially is probably the big one is like, you know, left, leaving community clubs and actually going, well, it's, they've changed. Um, and those people, we weeded the bad people out and, you know, whatnot. Because that's the first experience a child gets if he's ever, you know, given that. So I don't want my children, for example, to be in that position as well. Um, so, that, you know, in the education that I got from working in Victorian cricket to try and educate clubs was probably really, um, you know, first-hand experience learning and, and breaking some of those barriers is, is, is a big thing as well. Um, so, yeah, just educating people on why they shouldn't do things, but also changing the game. Um, yeah, big area. I think mine's quite similar is um, inclusivity. Yeah. So I don't want, um, you know, the, the whole, we've already got a team in mind and that's that's the team yeah. and any newcomers this is a conversation we had um, yeah. prior to this you know that um, people coming in well, no no we've already got a team we don't want you yeah. it's I, that i think is is um and there are some prejudices that, that go on that are behind that um but i think what you see experience is that no no we don't want you it doesn't matter you know whatever else yeah uh yeah we've got our minds already set and you're not part of this plan. <laughs> I think, yeah, and, and the big thing there is just welcoming the person as a whole, right? Getting to know them, getting to understand them and, you know, whether it be your South Asian community, your Asian community, what other, you know, women and girls, all, all these communities, I think they're all relatable is that you just need to get to know people, right? And once you get to know people at a deeper level, all of a sudden you've got this connection, you've got this, you know, great stuff, all of a sudden you're going to be there for longer you've had an experience that, you know, um, that's done that. I guess the last kind of bit I want to, all three of us have experienced and we've kind of, we've jumped sports clubs and within our sports. And I guess, you know, what's the reason? There's a, there's a big kind of assumption in the system that, um, you know, these these teams will just move, you know, but why, but why is it that these teams move? And I guess, you know, do you guys want to talk about your experiences? So as a youngster, I think, I needed to get out of the community club I was in um, to sort of progress in terms of playing for rep cricket. Um, and that was just better coaching, better facilities, 
um, and so forth. So yeah, that was sort of first-hand experience. Um, in Australia, changing clubs is pretty pretty tough because you become part of a, um, a, a wider community if you play for particular premier clubs as well. Um, but you kind of need to do it to, to progress as well if opportunities aren't there. So um, I guess first-hand, you know, providing, um, you know, opportunities, uh, better facilities, um, and, and sort of getting an experience for the club as well. If it's not going to be the right fit, then, you know, have that ability to go to another. First I, I think for us, the we felt... Um, we didn't feel any, I guess, loyalty to the club, and we didn't feel that the club had any loyalty to us as a team. Um, as I said, we were we were a bunch of mates that played cricket, uh, and at whatever level we played at. And for us, it, became, it came to a point where, yeah, we we played in Ross School, um, and thought oh, actually Grafton has better facilities, so we, it wasn't really much of much thought process behind it. It's, it's in, in Auckland, it's really easy to move clubs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so we moved uh, to Grafton because we felt had better facilities. Yeah. Um, Eden Ross School was where we started playing because that we um, grew up around Ross School, so it was just there. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Yeah, and I guess you know that kind of stuff, and then obviously experience. My experience was a little bit different. It was kind of I came through the grades at, at Grafton as a, as a young kid, and you know as as the teams went on, you kind of you get getting bumped down and bumped down and all of a sudden you were there for four or five hours and you literally fielded the ball and then that was it. You know, you bowled, I think, looking back at my stats, if I remember, I bowled like four overs or something in a whole season, batted three times. You know, what kind of kid wants to be in that kind of environment? And, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to do with the South Asian connotation, but just giving everyone a fair opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess while we, before we wrap up, is there something that you guys, you know, if there's one, one tip or one, one kind of key thought process that you'd want our clubs to to go through after coming through this conversation um, and listening into our experiences, what would it be? I think we, we spoke about it before. If you look at a cricket oval, it's got two circles. Inside this middle circle, the 30 meter circle, put down who are all your community members and you know current members of your club. What ethnicities do they have? What backgrounds do they have? And then look at that, the the, the outside of the circle. How do, how do we engage those community members that are not part of our community? And essentially you'd, you'd find that, you know, there's ways to try and engage those people, um, but how do we do it then? Um, community members, players, uh, supporters, sponsors, they're all part of that as well. Um, so essentially it's it works hand in hand. The 30 meter circle inside will have all these people. So you've got Jimmy the plumber, you've got the sponsor, you've got Mike, comes to the bar all the time and you know Bob who sits there and Raj who opens the batting for example but you might have a Southeast Asian community around you and how do we actually engage with that community is it language barriers um, are we engaging with the LGBTIQ you know Q community um, disability community how do we break down the barriers to actually get those people in and a lot of the time it is education um, working in the disability space um, I educated myself so a lot of the times it was like, um, can we start a cricket team for people with intellectual disabilities? And sitting around the board boardroom would usually be the same answers. Oh, we don't have disability toilets. Like, what do you need the disability you know, um, toilets for? And then you'd educate them on, well, it's intellectual disabilities who won't need those physical disability toilets, you know? And so then they'll say, oh, oh we don't have ramps. Well, there are ramps, so we can <laughs> access the net so we can access the cricket wicket um, or they've got an intellectual so they don't need those things you know sort of thing so it's really it's educating people around you um, understanding your community and how do you break those barriers how do we keep them in the game is probably the hardest one um, by creating change that's going to be systematic change and then long-term changes it's not just a short-term fix because you need a fast bowler or you need a badminton player or you need a squash player and you're going oh that, that's the Asian community how do we tackle that um, so yeah really really educating others around you but also knowing as I said that 30 meter circle who are the people who are the people on the outside that we can educate and yeah so just echoing that eh? I think inclusivity so um, being part of an Indian community so 
um, called Kanadakuta. So basically all the people from Karnataka, which is a state that Bangalore is in, um, we all speak Kannada and there's a whole community of, of us that get together and do a whole variety of things. Um, and, you know, some of the, there's those sorts of communities for people from across uh, India that are, exist here and they're playing through competitions versus each other, you know, and there's the, the whole families come out and again, they bring out the food, they bring out, you know, they bring out everything. So the cricket's already happening um, and it's being attended, well attended and well organized by the people within those communities. How do you then get, how do, how do clubs, I guess, open their doors and become um, community first? So if they want the community to come into you, well, how do you, how do you open those doors so the community want to come, come engage with you as opposed to, as, as you said, I need a fast bowler. Okay, well, I'm going to go down and watch this game. There you go. There's my fast bowler. Well, you come play for me. Why, where's the why? <laughs> so I think that's that's a really, really cool. Thing. It works hand in hand. Community yeah. clubs need sponsors, yeah. you know, um, and these communities already have business owners. They yeah, have. exactly. So essentially, it yeah. works hand in hand. It grows the wider community. Yeah. It becomes that was a big thing. Is it becomes a community hub mm -hmm. rather than a cricket club yeah. or a softball club or a badminton club it actually becomes a community exactly. hub but then education comes in after that coaches from south asian volunteers from south yeah. asian um why do we need to do it because we need this community to be running or this community hub to be running exactly um long term sort of thing as well so, and I, honestly i don't think you're gonna have, i think if a club does that well they're not going to be short on volunteers yeah. it's it's just getting to a point where you've got that a community hub model you've got the community coming to you saying cool you know what are we doing next um as opposed to you always going out to the community saying come play for us come come here and so it's just building those real um real kind of relationships those genuine relationships yeah. where people can be like okay well we've kind of learned that and i guess um i guess i'll get a little story from me is you know when we came into this role into this indian space at sport white Arkady, what we found was that you had to give a lot as a as an organization we had to give a lot to our communities um our communities our indian communities that surrounded us and give them a lot before they kind of came back to us and did what we wanted to do and what you know what programs we were to run so i think that's really that's really in a nutshell what you know what we're saying is if you really want to connect with these communities build a genuine relationship it's not about really the numbers it's about how we're going to continue to be together and this bond or whatever you want to call it for for the rest of you know your your sport playing careers and, you know we see a lot of clubs stalwarts and all of our sports clubs and you know they've been there for years and they're you you know usually european or whatever it may be how can we get our south asian communities to be like members as well right mm -hmm. and you know that's that's a great kind of your way to think about it and you know little raj that started at five years old what are we going to do to make them a life member in our club and, yeah. and be someone that's um, i think i think yeah. one other thing it works both ways you yeah. need communities so south asian communities for example to actually break the ice so we found it as a barrier to for girls to participate in cricket mm -hmm. how did we then create it we girls only cricket got the mums to volunteer mums were running it training sessions with female coaches um, then we broke the ice and put them into a club competition but they were still part of the community, right? So we first have to make those little steps by getting the girls to play yeah. um, from a grassroots perspective, getting the female coach and doing all those little things to actually get it up and running. But now you've got leagues that are running um, in Victoria, for example, that have got from the South Asian communities, dads that are you know, thriving to try and get women's cricket up and running. And those are probably started from little things of, you know, little clubs, community clubs that, never would have thought about you know women's cricket for example um to be involved in and so forth so we had to then make the change within the club to actually understand that why do we need to do this 50 uh, percent of the population weren't playing the game how do we actually break that by actually creating an inclusive club mm -hmm. so that's you know john who's got a cigarette outside and bob who's standing there with his beer and breaking that taking down the women's posters and putting, you know, uh, sorry, men's posters and putting, you know, female players up there and changing that sort of perception as well. So, um, and then as you mentioned earlier, it's those community groups that are already playing, how do we get them 
um, there's a whole lot of festivals for South Asian communities. How do we then utilize them and get the wider community engaged at the same time? Um, girls only Diwali cricket days, for example, or softball cricket festivals. Um, so then, wow, there's a diamond in the rough, but also in the same respect, there's a female mum that you'd never think, for example, a mum that you'd never think she would play cricket is playing cricket now. Um, and then part of a community club as well. So her daughter, you know, grows up and she's part of the community as well. Um, so yeah, it's just looking at different ways that you can sort of engage, especially in the woman girl space, because you're breaking breaking the ice there. And you guys have both, both said it, right? It's not a short term thing. You can't say, I'm going to go and do one thing today and expect that this coming cricket season, every South Indian is going to come play for me. Yeah. That's just not going to happen. It, you know, you've got to, it, it's lots and lots and lots of small steps that in the long run, maybe two, three, four, five years, that's when, that's when the, the, you'll start getting the, the real returns, the long-term engagement, the real um, sustainability uh, piece going. Yeah, no, I think you guys have, have made some great points and I would think, um, you know, and on that note, we, we just got, we're gonna close up the session, but I'd just like to say thank you very much to both of you for taking out your time and um, coming in and, you know, hanging out with us and having a chat on the couch. And obviously um, this is our second one, but the first of our diversity series, which we hope um, to have another one in the new year. Um, but just before I, just before I close off the session, just a couple of things. Oh, just one thing really is we've got a West Auckland Club Leaders Forum, um, which is happening on at TPI Centre on December the 15th. So if you haven't got your tickets already, make sure you head to humanitix.com, which is H-U-M-A-N-I-T-I-X.com and um, search Sport Waitakere and you'll, our Mick has done a lovely, lovely job of um, working around there and getting it all sorted. So make sure you pay him a compliment while you're there. Um, but we're also, you know, we've got our Facebook groups, which are the West Auckland Coach, Coaching, um, Leader, Coaching Network and the Club Leaders Network. So that's going to have all our future events and little nuggets and bits and pieces of information um, that you'll be able to find there. So um, if, there has, if the session's raised any questions or you want to explore more and, um, and get in touch with you know, us at Sport Waitakere, um, we're more than happy to help, especially in the South Asian space. You know, you know you've got myself, Nish is also here um, and our team as well. So we're more than happy to support you um, with that journey, what, whatever it may be. Um, so thank you for joining us and I'll close us off with a karakia. Um, tutawa mai runga, tutawa mai raro, tutawa mai roto, tutawa mai waho, ki a tau o te Māori tū, ki a tau o te Māori ora, ki a tātou katoa. Tuturu whakamaua ki a tina, haumea hui e tai ki e. Thank you very much. <laughs>